Okay, so you think you know the Antiques Roadshow? Here's a trivia question to test you. Which ceramics expert is the son of a famous actor? Just one of the things you'll learn on this edition of Priceless Antiques Roadshow. Hello again from the archive of the Antiques Roadshow. In today's show, stand by for surprises as we open our book of revelations. So as a lad, you never took these screws off no. and looked and saw what was underneath. No. You're not serious. I am serious. You've had it all this time. I've had it possibly 70 years now. Three Roadshow experts go on a mission to hunt down bargain buys. This just sums up everything you can think about 1950s and 1960s design. It's like a UFO landed. And Lars Tharp on his love-hate relationship with all things musical. There is a conspiracy to point strange, unfamiliar, unplayable, ridiculous musical instruments at me. Some of the best moments on the Antiques Roadshow are when our experts reveal things about an heirloom that the owner knew nothing about. And the bigger the surprise, the better. Look at that! Isn't that amazing? In 2005, one couple sought Tim Wanacott's advice about some inherited oriental rugs. Well, you would think that Captain Birch, having been an army officer and been in the Middle East, would have bought something in the Middle East that came from the Middle East. Well, you would think so. Well, you'd be wrong. <laughs> One of the great joys, of course, is, is explaining something to someone which surprises them. This cannot be more Islamic looking as a cloth in all the wide world. Oh, and this is... When people bring things to the roadshow, one of the first questions that they want to know is, where was it made? And you look at it for two seconds and you say it was made in Germany. And they say, how do you know? And you say, actually, look there, it says made in Germany. And they think you're ever so clever. But the fact is that people live with these things all their lives, and maybe all their parents' and grandparents' lives, and it's never been looked at. I received it when I was probably about four, and the judge of that is the fact that I could sit on it and with my little legs paddle along. A case in point was the P2 Alfa Romeo that came into the Oban Roadshow. Fabulous toy, big toy, bright red, and an important toy, except it had been pushed out of shape by the owner's bottom. It dates from the 1930s. Now, you've got it in its traditional Italian racing colors, uh, the exhaust zipping out to the back here, the big filler cap so that you could put the uh, petrol in. And it's extraordinary that he hadn't realized that it was, in fact, a clockwork toy. And when I said, you know, that's where you stick the key in, here is the arbor where it would have been wound up with the key. Now, I take it you don't have the key. Did you know I never knew it had mechanical innards? You're not serious. I am serious. You've had it all this time? I've had it, may must be 70 years now. Well, because underneath I, here. I was the engine always. So you said, so as a lad, you never took these screws off no. and looked and saw what was underneath? No. It was a revelation to him. It was, it was a great moment, and, um, and I hope that it's now given him years of enjoyment of it actually running around the living room rather than him trying to sit on it. Well, I would have thought we're talking about around 1,200 to maybe 1,500 pounds. Right. When you get it home, see if you can find a clock key to fit this, and you'll never have to sit on it again. Thank you. But the best revelation of all is when an owner simply has no idea what they have on their hands. David Battit will never forget a 17th century delftware plate which had been dug up in pieces on a London building site. When I first saw James' plate at the mansion house, my first reaction was, oh, what a tragedy. But it was immediately replaced by the thought of, thank God, he saved the bits. Have you tracked down who this is? No. You don't know who it is? What, no. do you, what do you think this was? Just a couple of letters. A couple of letters, OK. 
It was a fascinating place. I mean, the thing about it was that, that not only is Delphware of that period quite uncommon, but it was a royal portrait. That I stands for Jacobus, James. And that is DV, is actually DU, and there should be an X on the end, Dux, Duke. And this was when James II was Duke of York during the reign of Charles II. And it was a rare royal portrait. He went on to become James II. I mean, you know, what more could you ask for? This is about 1665. So it's a very early plate. The nice thing about it is that the portrait is so good. Normally they're very cursory and really rather silly, but that's actually quite sensitively done and very rare. And the great thing about Delftware is, is that it can be restored pretty much so that you can't tell that there was ever a problem. And he didn't know what I was going to say. He didn't know whether I was going to say, well, put it back in another hole. So it was, it was quite sort of quiet to start with, but the more I told him, you could see his excitement growing. Although it's damaged, this would be wanted desperately by a museum. A London Museum would want it. Collectors would want it. And I don't think... I mean, how much would you accept for it? I wouldn't know. I... 20 pounds? No, I, I... 100 pounds. Come on, you're getting tempted. After the information you give me, yeah. 500 pounds. 1,000. 2,000. I lay claim to being the first to do the mock auction method of pricing something. And in that particular case, um, I think it, it did work actually rather well, um, better than other times I've done it. <laughs> 10,000? Jeez. I think it could make 10,000 pounds. It's such a rare, desirable piece. And he was amazed all the way through by what I was telling him. David Batty certainly built up the tension with that valuation. And acting skills run deep in some parts of the roadshow team. I can now reveal it is Fergus Gambon, part of our ceramics lineup. His father is the actor Sir Michael Gambon. And here's Fergus to tell us how he first began collecting, way back in his childhood. Well, I'm afraid I was a bit of a weird child, and I started buying porcelain at a very young age. One of the collections I formed was a collection of English porcelain figures made in the 18th century. And this little chap reminds me of that collection. He's Bow, which is a porcelain factory in London, and he was made in about 1760 or 1765, and he represents Pedrolino from the Commedia dell'arte series. He's just a beautiful, charming little Cockney Sparrow, really. I was born in London, and I love him for the fact that he was made in London, too. This particular model was a model that I always wanted. I spent years lusting after a bow, Pedrolino, and one hadn't come on the market for a long, long time. I saw it in the auction catalogue. I was broke, I was a child. And I said to my mum and dad, if I don't have a birthday present, and if I don't have a Christmas present, will you buy me the bow Pedrolino? And they both looked kind of, hmm. But after a while they said yes. So I said to my mother, well, how much do I bid up to, mum? And she looked me in the eye and she said, Fergus, I trust you. I trust you to be sensible. So I went along to the sale and I sat down in the sale room and I stuck my hand up and I started bidding. And I bid 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 until I got it for three times the auction house's pre-sale estimate. <laughs> and I then went off pre-mobile phone days to a call box and I phoned my mum and I said, Mum, I've just bought this figure. And there was a silence, a long, long silence. And basically, she didn't speak to me for a month. <laughs> And she didn't give me the figure, which she had to pay for, of course. She didn't give me the figure for my birthday, and she didn't give me my figure for Christmas. I got it a year later as a punishment for being such a greedy, unpleasant little child. But it is a measure of, of you know, how bad it can get when you really, really want something. 
And you know, Fergus still won't reveal what he paid for that first figure. Must have been a heck of a lot of pocket money. Now, careful spending is very much a theme of our next feature. We're asking three of our Antiques Roadshow team members to demonstrate their canny buying skills. They've each got a budget of £75 to try and buy a collectible that has a useful function. So let's see how they got on. Let's meet the specialists, all of whom have a very distinctive style and equally strong ideas about how best to combine beauty and practicality in one object. First, there's the flamboyant Catherine Higgins, who loves anything with colour and texture. Next is Stephen Moore, whose eclectic taste means he isn't afraid to experiment by mixing up different styles. And finally, we have Mark Hill, who has a talent for reinventing items from overlooked eras to cut a thoroughly modern dash. It was the famous 19th century designer William Morris who said, have nothing in your house that you do not know to be useful or believe to be beautiful. And today our experts have 75 pounds to spend on something that fulfills both those criteria. When you're thinking of buying something functional, you might want to consider something electrical. If you do, it's very important to make sure that it's going to be safe to use. So this lamp here, this 1950s lamp behind me, has been rewired and been tested by a qualified electrician, whereas this lamp here, which isn't for sale, still carries its original two-core wiring, which hasn't got an earth. It's very important that you don't buy something like that because it's the responsibility of the dealer to make sure that it has been rewired. You want to be safe. At antiques fairs, dealers often remove the wiring from old electrical items altogether. This means an added cost to get them back in working order. This is fantastic. This just sums up everything you can think about 1950s and 1960s design. It's like a UFO landed. Think of all those B-movies and fantastic science fiction movies that were so popular during the 1950s and 60s. It's a heater. So you'd have it in your living room or hallway or something like that by a company called Sophono, and it was designed in 1959. I've seen them sell for a lot more than the £20 price tag on this. I'd love to buy it. Um, I'd love to own it and, and heat my house with it. The only problem are these little bits of damage here and a large bit of damage on the back. If it was going to be taken home with me today, I'd like to see it in slightly better condition. So I think with enormous regret, I'm going to leave this one. Stephen is always on the lookout for something that combines form with function. Now, something like this, and this fulfills everything I've been talking about with antiques. You know, it's a 1950s thermos flask. Um, you would fill it with water and then you just put the, the cork lid in like that to keep the water cold while you're having lunch or whatever. And, you know, it's very elegant. It could almost be based on the form of a Georgian coffee pot. And, you know, it's in practically new condition. And it's 11 pounds. I mean, it's not for me, but it's a bargain. After his disappointment over the space age heater, has Mark found something else to tickle his fancy? This 1930s chandelier has really caught my eye. It's made of brass with a cast phenolic, which is an early type of plastic used in the 1920s and 30s, and effectively derived from bakelite, I suppose, which was the first synthetic plastic. This bright orange colour is typical of what you find today, but originally it would have been much lighter, it would have been a creamy colour. I actually quite like it because it reminds me of the 1930s, the age of jazz. Adding a lighting feature like this is a fantastic way to add a period touch to a room. I think for £65, it's an absolute bargain. If this was in a design shop in, in maybe central London or somewhere like that, I could easily see the price being £150, £200. So this is the sort of thing I mean when you come to a fair like this. It's rainy, it's cold, it's hard work, but every now and again you find a little gem just like this Art Deco light fitting. Mark tells me that to have a 1930s light fitting rewired to present day safety standards will cost him a maximum of £50. Not a bad price to pay for a piece of working Art Deco design. Now, has Catherine found what she's looking for? This is what I've chosen as my functional item. It's a piece of fabric, but not just any piece of fabric. It's actually uh, a curtain 
And personally, I think the, the pattern itself is very striking. It's desperately post-war, 1950s, and the, the pattern title is called Nautilus by a great screen printer designer called Mary Warren. Fabric is something that's very underrated as a collectible and has tremendous potential. The more that's being discovered about um, post-war fabric and textile design, the more the price is set to increase. A little bit of damage here and there, um, a little bit of um, discoloration on the side here, but I'm going to take that with a pinch of salt and anything that's left over, I turn into cushions. It's priced at £75, which is just within my price range, so I'm going to go for it and watch it grow as a collectible. Both Catherine and Mark have definitely fulfilled the brief of beauty and practicality. Can Stephen make it a hat trick? This has just got to be my functional item. I've got great 60s styling, Regent tone here and brass, Baker-like knobs, walnut veneer, I love it. I know it may not be functioning now and it may not get high definition, but what a great wacky side table this is going to make. It's 50 pounds, it's a wonderful piece of early technology and in a few years to come, these sort of things will be really sought after. A little bit of cleaning and polishing on it, a little bit of wash down, I love it. It even comes with Naughty Dog. Hmm, interesting choice. Three very different approaches to the challenge from three very different specialists. With some attention from a qualified electrician, Mark's light fitting will make a splendid addition to any room. Catherine's 1950s print fabric was right on budget and is set to become a future classic. I think Stephen cheated with his defunct 1960s TV as side table as he was supposed to find something functional, but he reckons it's a real talking point. Yes, a talking point. That's certainly one way of putting it. One of the guaranteed longest queues at the Antiques Roadshow is to see the picture team. And they must see hundreds of images every day. We asked our art specialist, Grant Ford, to pick one of his more memorable roadshow finds. The steeplechase by Sybil Andrews. Tell me where you found it. Uh, it was a car boot. Car boot sale. Car boot sale, yeah. I hadn't seen really anything in the morning, and then suddenly one of our reception staff turned up with this fantastic image by Sybil Andrews called The Steeplechase. The wonderful thing about Sybil Andrews was that she was um, particularly interested in cubism and futurism. And with this particular print, you get a real sense of strength and speed with the horses. There was definitely a sense in this picture of machine-like movement, real dynamism and great colour too. Three horses taking a hedge, but it was a stunning modernist lino print, a print, but hugely collectible and very, very rare to find. In 1918, she was working in a factory as a welder, so, so she really got the sense of the machine age. Do you know, it was the most exciting thing to find this particular print, because the print wasn't produced in large numbers, and the gentleman who brought it in had found it at a car boot sale for four pounds. What drew you to the picture of this car boot sale? Well, the simplicity and the colours and the movement that's depicted and the subject as well. So you visit many car boots? I did do at one time, yeah. Not anymore. Do you think this could be valuable? No, I just liked it. Well, it is marked 32 out of 50, so it's a limited edition of 50. It's a very well-known image, very rare image and the sort of image that's very sought after at the moment. Right, cool. And it's worth about five to eight thousand pounds. joking. Not a bad boot buy that, was it? Thank you very much. Yes, I'd be pretty happy if I picked that up at a car boot. Now, if you're musically inclined, stand by to cover your ears. I think definitely a bit more practice required. And you see, a lot of musical instruments turn up at our shows, and there are one or two candidates on the team who always seem to end up with them. But perhaps that's because they've more than a passing interest in the subject. It's a shame uh, that, that not more people bring in musical instruments. I would love to see somebody bring in a good old drum kit one day. That would be fun, because it's nearly an antique now, you know. 
but the other experts have to be pretty quick off the mark if they want to beat Lars Tharp to the valuation of a musical instrument, especially if it's something out of the ordinary. And now you tell me about this. He called it his musical glasses. I think he paid between 40 and 60 pounds for them. Ooh. Which for a canny Scot and a farmer, 35, 30 to 35 years ago, yes. was quite a lot. The secret is not necessarily to have the glasses wet, but to have your fingers wet. Yes, indeed, that? yes. Yeah, OK. Well, we've got what it looks like two octaves. Wrong note. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Well done. Oh, they recognise it, they recognise it. <laughs> Even though he's a classically trained musician, Lars can't resist the challenge of anything that makes a noise. There is no doubt that there is a conspiracy at the reception to point strange, unfamiliar, unplayable, ridiculous musical instruments at me. <laughs> A chart well, uh, a woman brings in an extraordinary uh, Victorian multi horned object, which I'm sure was put together by some Victorian plumber. It's a car horn, isn't it? That's what it is. <laughs> it's obviously the, the uh, German secret weapon in the Umpar band. What do you call this? I don't know. That's why I came here to find out. That was quite fun. I, it, it, took, it took about half an hour to climb out of it. <laughs> the greatest uh, cruelty I have ever inflicted on the great British public was, I think, in Inverness. It was an interesting instance because the Scottish public who were around me watching this Sassenach destroying their national instrument. They actually started clapping before I'd finished, in order to stop me. Music is rhythm, and rhythm is in everything we do. But it's been quite a while since John Bly's had a chance to show off his musical prowess. Evocative, so I didn't really think it was coming for that big organ. No. <laughs> it's a long time since I um, tinkled the ivories on the programme. Um, in fact, it's 1981, and there were two harmoniums, which uh, that was great fun actually doing that. Played one poor old wheezy thing, but it was all right. I was amazed to see how young I was. <laughs> They're still not very valuable, but for insurance, anywhere between 200 and 300 pounds. My playing keyboards. Um, was before Lars joined the show, and and he's a better pianist than I am by far. <laughs> so I think anything that comes in with a keyboard now he will play, and justifiably so too. It's not bellows, is it? It's a glockenspiel. Is it? Yeah, it's a xylophone. But it's with stringed instruments that Lars really excels. I have been playing the cello since I was eight years old. The cello is actually something that's quite close to my heart. Uh, you wouldn't think so if you heard me play it, but it is. And, uh, and so whenever a cello comes in, I really am quite interested. Written by Cyril the owners of this beautiful cello produced documentation which suggested it had been made for Queen Charlotte, wife of George III at the end of the 18th century. Okay. A trio of stringed instruments were made by Norris and Barnes around 1790 for the Queen of England. And the man writing this letter thinks that this instrument yes. is one of those three. One of those three. I can't contain my excitement. Now, hang on. Just hang on. Stringed instruments of the violin family potentially are very, very valuable. It was a very special cello. You only had to look at it uh, to realise that. I do travel in my car with my very poor second-rate cello bow. And Will you let me have a go on it? Be my guest. Uh, 
I remember it as soon as he, the first notes were played, I recognised it straight away. John whispered to me and he said, that's the piece my mum used to play. And it meant so much more to me. I thought, ah, that's a wish granted. I'd waited 50 years to hear that instrument being played. I never thought I would. It was a beautiful sound. Well, um, it is a beautifully mellow tone. With a letter like that, it would take weeks, if not months, of research to try to find out whether this was indeed an instrument made for the royal family. So I can't give you an answer to that. But I can tell you that a late 18th century English cello of this caliber, this quality, will generally on the market today not sell for much less than £20,000. So that's a starting point. Now, if we were to discover that that letter was right and this cello had a royal association, then we start adding more and more value to it. I would like to, to uh, verify that royal connection if ever we can. But nobody really wants to know about that. They, they, they sort of dismiss it as sort of uh, a bit of uh, fiction, as it were. We've met rather a blank wall, really. So, we're living in hope. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't too shabby at the cello, was he, Lars? And he was responsible for introducing another musical interlude to the Antiques Roadshow. A bit less melodic. Yes, it's the curse of the mobile phone, interrupting the action. Here's the first recorded incident. And uh, Bunny comes over to me in her impressive raincoat. She's help me out, Lars, with this Latin. She got a lantern which had a Latin inscription on it. And, uh, you know, it's a long time ago since I did Latin O level. And then suddenly the cameraman said, We've got to record this now. I teach is docao, so teach or illuminate. And I start sort of hamming it up with, with what little Latin I had. And uh, in the middle of all this, suddenly, doo -doo, doo -doo, I illuminate the shadows. And I think, oh, no, I've left my mobile phone on. I'll just muddle through. They won't hear it. So simple. Like everything when you know how. But, of course, the volume went up and up and up and up. And someone's got the pink and panther it's not going through mine. Them. Not mine. And in the end, I had to come clean. It must be mine. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> and it was all downhill from there. Stand by for the first performance of the Antiques Roadshow Orchestra. Less a cantata? More a cacophony. Goodbye. So sorry, that's my pocket. <laughs> I've got the Antiques Roadshow playing. It was my son who put it on. Yeah, I believe you. How do I turn this thing off? <laughs> sorry, Jim. No, that's my mobile phone. <laughs> I can't believe that. Oh, you are so in the I am day. so sorry. So poor. <laughs> Later tonight, Monty Don fulfills a childhood dream to be a blacksmith as he and three novices learn the ancient art. Mastercrafts on BBC Two at nine. But next, Britain's busiest skier, Chemi Olcott, takes her first run in the women's slalom. Winter Olympics next on BBC Two.